Rob Palinka extending Vando on a four-year, $48 million extension makes the Lakers' young core for the future around LeBron and AD better than ever. For $12 million per year, securing a 24-year-old for his prime years whose defensive rating in purple and gold equated to second best at the power forward position only behind Giannis is another steal for the Rob father in what's been an all-encompassing 2023 for LA. While they lost Germany's World Cup MVP in Schroeder, Resigning D'Lo and AR-15, picking up Gabe Vincent and drafting Jalen Hood Shafino counteracts the loss of Dennis, shifting to the front court, and Rob not only extended Vando, but extended Anthony Davis, re-signed Rui Hachimura, and picked up Torian Prince, Christian Wood, Jackson Hayes, and Cam Reddish. Prior to reflecting on a roller coaster calendar year and breaking down why the Lakers winning the 2023 offseason by far is so noteworthy, just 17.2% of you watching right now are subscribed, so please help increase that number by pressing the sub box. Also, leave a like for the YouTube algorithm, and for a follow back, follow at Hoops on Instagram and Twitter. Thank you for supporting my channel. First, let's flash back to February 9th of 2023, when the Lakers sat all the way down at 12th place in the Western Conference, two games back of the final play-in spot. It was on this date where they traded Russell Westbrook in a three-team, eight-player deal. Receiving D'Angelo Russell, Jared Vanderbilt, and the now departed Malik Beasley in exchange for Russ, Damian Jones, Juan Toscano Anderson, and a 2027 first round draft pick, a few weeks after dealing Kendrick Nunn and three second round picks for Rui Hachimura, reversed LA's fortunes. In the final 28 games of the season following the acquisitions of D'Lo and Vando, the Lakers went 18 and 9, the fourth best record in the NBA over that span qualifying them for the seventh seed in the West and home court advantage in the play-in, where they edged out a win against Minnesota. D'Angelo, Jared, and Rui picked up a ton of the extra weight that LeBron and Anthony were previously forced to carry on their back. Capping off our flashback, and Los Angeles proceeded to shock the world as heavy underdogs against both Memphis and Golden State in the first and second rounds, winning each matchup in six, and closing out both the Grizz and Dubs on their home floor at Crypto, getting swept by Jokic Murray and the Denver Nuggets in the West Finals, though, stopped the miracle run directly in its tracks. That said, it wouldn't have been a miracle run in the first place without the just-extended Vanderbilt, who provided crucial perimeter-clamping defense. Vando was a nuisance guarding any position Coach Darvinham assigned to him, specifically opposing point guards, where he was a primary matchup for Stephen Curry and Ja Morant. His 7-1 reach, quick hands, foot speed, slithery screen navigation, and elusive body language allowed Jared to change the complexion of both must-win regular season and playoff games. But as good as Vando was on defense, and I think his contract extension was a bargain because of that, his lack of offense forced Coach Ham to sub him out in some important moments. Vando having to be replaced at times due to a lack of floor spacing ability allowed Jamal Murray to average 32.5 points per game against LA in the conference finals. That's precisely why getting Vando another elite wing defender in Torian Prince will be a key acquisition. Prince is an extremely high motor, in your face, sneakily reactive defender who, in a game against these very Lakers, had three steals in the 21 22 season. A big time luxury is the fact that he isn't a liability on offense. This man dropped a career high 35 points in a game in 22 23 and has shot 37.2% from distance over 424 career games, almost 10 percentage points better than the Vandalorian's career three point percentage. On defense, though, Vando and Prince both play with elusive hustle. Palinka really thought this move through because Prince allows year 21 LeBron to focus on offense that much more. At this stage of his career and at his age, you don't want LeBron to have to waste too much energy on the defensive side, but it came to the point where he had to expend that really all playoffs long. Loading up on bodies over the past half year, from Rui to then Vando and now Prince, makes this Laker team equipped for the long haul on the wing in a league filled with dominant perimeter talents. Complementing LeBron and Davis in the playmaking and shot manufacturing department tremendously last season was another former Minnesota Timberwolf in D'Angelo Russell. D'Lo averaged over 17 points and 6 assists, plus shot 41.4% from 3-point range in 17 regular season games for LA, being extremely reliable for Darvin Ham. But, 
His production decreased by the round in the playoffs to the point where he averaged just over 6 points in the conference finals against Denver and saw the majority of his minutes get granted to newest Toronto Raptor and German World Cup MVP Dennis Schroeder. That performance led to a ton of criticism towards D'Lo, including Zach Buckley of Bleacher Report believing that trading D'Lo is the right call. Next to a drive and kick heavy point forward in LeBron, plus the fact that you already have a high volume off the dribble weapon in Austin Reeves, Buckley does bring up some decent points regarding the fact that most of what D'Angelo is tasked with in the offense is spot up shooting. Given D'Lo's game is so much more than simply catching and releasing, at times he went outside of himself and stalled the offense. But D'Angelo's extra bit of shot creation whether that comes in the form of making the properly timed pass or jumper off the bounce, proved to be a fundamental part of LA's equation last season. While his IQ and shooting consistency took a turn for the worst in the West Finals against Denver, if he can come to terms with the fact that he doesn't have to do too much for LA to succeed, his three-level scoring skill set will allow him to fluidly let the game come to him and be a real factor. Players that can do what D'Angelo does in terms of creating something out of nothing are not expendable by any means. Don't forget about the chemistry aspect and how much Russell helped out in that department. It's evident that his teammates rally behind him and respect him as a vocal leader, therefore trading D'Lo isn't the way to go. With the overwhelming amount of depth Rob Palinka has acquired, one of the most important factors to consider here are the lineups Darvin Ham decides to roll with and whom he opts to make primary staples in the rotation. The starting five of D'Lo, Reeves, Rui, LeBron, and AD is probably set in stone, but at the gridlocked backup 3, 4, and 5 spots, you can expect heated training camp, preseason, and early regular season battles to determine who secures those positions between Vando, Seawood, Max Christie, Prince, Reddish, and Hayes. But depending on matchups, that gives the Lakers a ton of options, and those players would be locks to get consistent minutes on just about any other team but playing time isn't guaranteed for them given how deep the Lakers are up front. In the backcourt off the pine, Gabe Vincent and Jalen hood Shafino will be an interesting combination. Developing Jalen is going to be important. He has shown solid poise for his age, but with how inexperienced he is, subbing out either AR or D'Lo early and re-entering one of them to operate the bench unit next to Vincent will likely be the way to go for Darvin Ham. What stands out the most out of anything for the 23-24 Lakers is the reinforcements they've given James and Davis. For those saying LBJ's too old, his 28 point per game near triple-double averages on 52% shooting in the conference finals while fighting through a battle of foot? Say otherwise. For those saying AD is too fragile, his 2023 playoff best 14.1 rebounds and 3.1 blocks per night in a postseason where he played all 16 games for Los Angeles puts that argument to rest. It's that championship tested 1 2 punch having the formidability of their supporting cast being significantly boosted, which is why the Lakers obliterating the 2023 offseason is being hyped up as much as it is. I want to know what excites you the most about LA in 2324. I'm going to give a shout out to the answer I feel is best down below in the comments section. Today's shout out goes to Andrew, who gives his take ultimately stating that fourth in the East would be the best possible scenario for Toronto, with eighth to ninth being the worst. I like that point about Darko's offensive scheming and the player development. Those are going to be two major determining factors without a doubt. Thanks for every take though. DFlow signing off.